Welcome to Building Character, the show where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. We'll be using 5th edition statistics and all books related to it. Today we're climbing aboard the hype train for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate by making my favorite character in the series, Link. First appearing in the NES classic The Legend of Zelda in 1986, Link is an adventurer that has slayed countless foes and conquered endless dungeons. He's a prime example of the strong silent type. Let's start out by figuring out exactly what we need to be the hero of time. First off, there are so many weapons and skills from so many different games I can't possibly get to them all. Instead, we need to build a character that can use any strange weapon they find. Secondly, Link traditionally takes down giant monsters in 3-5 to five hits, so we'll be building a character that can target an enemy's weak spots for massive damage. Finally, we'll make sure Link has access to some of his classic allies. For stats, we're going to be using a standard point buy from the player's handbook. That's 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. If you or your DM would rather have you roll stats, that's fine too. Just use this as a guide for where to put your highest and lowest. We're going to start with dexterity. It applies to most of the weapons Link uses, Megaton Hammer excluded. Next, we'll take Wisdom. As an explorer of the wilds, you'll need strong instincts. After that, strength for giant wrecking balls and climbing cliffs. Constitution for the next slot so you can get more heart containers as you level up. Second from the bottom is intelligence, as Link tends to have friends with him to help him with the brain busters. Finally, we're dumping charisma, as Link doesn't talk much or at all. Side note for roleplaying, you can still play the character as quiet without going full mute. Playing a character that doesn't communicate at all would be a bit of a nightmare for the rest of your party. Choosing a race, we'll go with Variant- wait, actually we're going to be choosing something else. Link's ears are pointy, and he seems to live a very long time at the beginning of Breath of the Wild, so I'm calling him an Elf. He's Hylian, so I'm going with High Elf just for the pun of it, and for the rest of the build. So bonuses from High Elf, you get plus 2 to your dexterity and plus 1 to your intelligence, proficiency with the perception skill, training with all sorts of weapon we won't get into for now, and a wizard cantrip of your choice. Take True Strike, it lets you spend your action to gain advantage on your next attack, as long as you don't lose concentration. Basically, you can take a turn to look for the monster's giant red weak spot. You also can speak common, elven, and a language of your choice. I'd go with Celestial so you can understand Ferore when she reaches out to you. Take the Outlander background, it gives proficiency with athletics and survival so you can climb up a mountain and then find something to restore your energy at the top. You also gain proficiency with a musical instrument, I'm going with an ocarina. Another language, I'd go with Primordial, it allows you to understand Gorons and Zora if they're speaking Terran and Aquan respectively. And finally, your background ability allows you to find food for up to five people per day and remember your way around without a map. I never really use them anyway. Now we need to pick a starting class, and we'll be picking Ranger, more specifically a Revised Ranger. For those out of the loop, the Ranger in the player's handbook was pretty bad. So in 2016, Wizards of the Coast sent out a revised version via an unearthed arcana online. You can see it with a quick Google search and it's much better. First, we'll talk about skills. You get three from a pretty decent list. I'd take Animal Handling, Nature, and Stealth, as you already have Perception and Athletics. You have proficiency with all simple and martial weapons, meaning whatever you find in the chest of a dungeon, you'll be ready to slay the boss with at the end of it. Your armor proficiency only goes up to medium, but you'll never be using anything higher than studded leather, so no worries there. You could also have a shield, and since there's no mechanical difference between wood or metal, get a Deku shield. It will actually matter later on, strangely enough. The first thing every ranger gets is a favorite enemy. This is a type of enemy you're just naturally great at finding and killing. You can choose from beasts, fey, humanoids, monstrosities, or undead. We're taking monstrosities because that covers a huge chunk of temple bosses. You get plus two to damage against them and advantage on survival and intelligence checks related to them. Basically, you're good at making your way to the boss and finding their big red weak spot. There's also another language gain from this relating to your enemy type. I'd recommend Abyssal, but feel free to take whatever you want as long as you can get your DM to sign off on it. First level ranger also gives you natural explorer, which grants a ton of passive abilities. On your own, you can ignore difficult terrain, which is good. You get advantage on initiative, which is great. And it gives you advantage on any creature that hasn't had its turn yet on the first turn, which is amazing. There are also benefits when you've been traveling for more than an hour, including that your group isn't slowed by difficult terrain, they can't become lost without magic, you stay alert while doing other traveling activities, you don't lose stealth traveling quickly while alone, find twice as much food while foraging, and know the exact numbers and size of creatures you're tracking and how long they went through the area. But other than that insane amount of useful abilities, first level rangers don't get much. 
Ranger level 2 is a little more simple. You get a fighting style. Go with archery, it gives you plus 2 to hit with ranged weapons, and that includes any ranged weapon, be it a slingshot or a homebrewed boomerang. The text is not specific to a bow. Additionally, you get two first level ranger spells and two first level slots. Cure wounds can heal you or an ally, 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier. Think of it as some lawn lawn milk. Hunter's Mark has a casting time of one bonus action and lets you deal an extra d6 to a creature you put it on, as long as you maintain concentration for an hour or 100 combat rounds. It lasts that long because anything taking this much damage from you at level 2 will probably try and run away. Thankfully, you have advantage on perception and survival checks to track it down if you didn't already from favorite enemy, but if you take down this monster, you can move your mark to another creature as a bonus action on your next turn without using another slot. We'll multi-class as a fighter next, which might seem a bit redundant, but trust me, it'll all come together soon. First level fighters get second wind, which allows you to heal 1d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action once per long rest. Link typically has a healing item or two with him. You also get another fighting style, take great weapon fighting. This lets you re-roll ones and twos on damage die with a two-handed or versatile propertyed weapon, like the Megaton Hammer, Vigoron Sword, or Wrecking Ball. But you have to use the new roll, even if it's still a one or two. Another level of fighter gives Action Surge, letting you take one extra action on a turn once per long rest. Use this to get an extra hit on the boss if you're doing speedrun strats. At fighter level 3, you get to pick an archetype, and we're choosing Cavalier from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, so Link can get the most out of his trusty steed, Epona. If you haven't gotten a riding horse yet, don't worry, we've got some options. First, you get a bonus proficiency, and you should take performance to get better at playing your ocarina. This should help you tame a wild horse, but you'll have to wait 7 years to win it from a gambling rat usurper. If that's not quite your style, a riding horse only costs 75 gold according to the player's handbook, so you should probably have enough to buy one by level 4. You're born to the saddle, which is the name of an ability. It gives you advantage on saving throws to falling off your mount, which happens if the mount is moved involuntarily and requires a DC 10 deck save to stay mounted. You should have plus 5 to deck saves by now, so you have two chances to roll a 5 or higher. Hopefully your dice can work with you on that. However, if they don't, you're not prone like you normally would be, as long as you're falling less than 10 feet. Oh, and you can mount with 5 feet of movement instead of the standard 15. Cavalier really is the gift that keeps on giving with Unwavering Mark. This lets you mark a creature you've hit with a melee attack until the end of your next turn. If you're within 5 feet of a marked creature, it has disadvantage on attacks against targets other than you. If it damages someone other than you, you can make an extra melee attack against them as a bonus action on your next turn. This attack has advantage and deals extra damage equal to half your fighter level rounded down. Your strength modifier determines how often you can make this attack per long rest. Your horse will have its own stats and HP, but acts with you in initiative. Its only actions are dashing, which doubles your movement from 60 to 120, disengaging, which allows you to move out of melee range without provoking opportunity attacks, or dodging, which imposes disadvantage on enemy attacks. That last one's important, as your horse only has 13 HP. So if you don't want your horse to die, go to fighter level 4 and take the mounted combatant feat instead of an ability score improvement. With this feat, you can force a target attacking your mount to attack you instead. You also have advantage on attacks on any creature, medium or smaller, while you are mounted. Finally, if your mount is subjected to a dexterity save to avoid damage, it takes half damage on failed saves and no damage on successes. If that sounds familiar, it's basically evasion. That's an ability rogues and monks get at 7th level, so this feat is an absolute must for anyone riding an animal. We're multi-classing as a third class for the first time ever in the channel's history. It might seem overly complicated, but hey, Link needs some druid levels and what else can we do? First level druids learn druidic, it's the language of the druids, and for a character that never talks, Link is sure collecting a whole lot of languages. More importantly, druids get cantrips and spells, the first of which is Thorn Whip, which we talked about last week, it serves the same purpose here. It's a melee spell attack, that means wisdom plus proficiency to hit. It deals 1d6 piercing and brings the target 10 feet closer to you if it's large or smaller. This was a grappling hook for Batman, it's a hook shot for Link. You also get Produce Flame, which lets you create a small fire in your hand that you can hold for up to 10 minutes and can be thrown 30 feet and deals 1d8 fire damage. It's a bomb, which used to have limits in the games, but as of Breath of the Wild, you can make as many as you want. Boom, it's a cantrip. Now, once again, we're multi-classing casters, so head to page 165 of the player's handbook to figure out how many slots you have. 
Your list of known druid spells is your wisdom modifier plus your druid level, and you can change it out every day. For first level spells, check out Jump, which allows you to triple the jump distance of an ally you touch for one minute, or in other words, lets their boots hover a bit. There's also Fairy Fire, which creates a 20 foot cube within 60 feet of you for up to a minute, as long as you don't lose concentration. Creatures inside make a deck save, and if they fail, they're illuminated by a blue light, and attacks against them have advantage. They also can't become invisible. Think of it as Navi helping you out with your Z targeting. We've maybe been leaning a bit heavily on Ocarina references in this build. Sorry, not sorry, it's my favorite game. Still, a second level of Druid gets us a bit of Twilight Princess abilities and grants the ability to Beast Shape. The normal rules of Beast Shaping are as follows. You have to have seen the beast you're transforming into before, so no dinosaurs, probably. You can use this twice per short rest. Your shapes are determined by your level. Level 2 means a challenge rating of 1 fourth or lower, and the creature can't have a swimming or flying speed. You can stay in this shape an amount of time equal to half your druid level rounded down, and you can exit this shape as a bonus action. You gain the physical stats of the creature you transform into, that's strength, dexterity, and constitution, but keep the soft stats, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma of your regular build, and can only gain, not lose, skill proficiencies. Your HP equals the beast's HP, which can be used for some extra health in a long fight, and return to whatever HP you were at if the shape's HP hits zero, taking any additional damage to your standard health. You can't speak or cast new spells, but you can maintain concentration spells, like Hunter's Mark. You lose dark vision unless the shape has dark vision too. Now that we're through that, we'll add some more rules by joining the Circle of the Moon. This gives you Combat Wild Shape, which lets you Wild Shape as a bonus action. Even better, you can now spend spell slots to heal yourself as a bonus action in the Wild Shape. You get 1d8 for every slot you use. You also get Circle Forms, which lets you change into an animal of challenge rating 1 or lower, which means instead of a normal wolf, you can be a dire wolf. Those stats are in the back of your player's handbook. You also get two second level spell slots, so check out Gust of Wind. I've explained it in an earlier video, and it's also in the player's handbook. Link uses wind all over the place in the games, from the Gale Boomerang in Twilight Princess, the Gust Bellows in Skyward Sword, or the Wind's Requiem in Wind Waker. I haven't talked about Locate Object yet, so let's run through that. You say the name of an object that you're familiar with, and you sense the direction it's in, how far away it is, if it's moving, and how fast it's moving. The object has to be something you've seen within 30 feet, or be a vague type of item. Jewelry, weaponry, etc. You can use this sense for up to 10 minutes depending on your concentration. It's kind of like a compass. Remember when this was a ranger build? Well, let's get back to that. Level 3 rangers get primeval awareness, which lets you communicate very simple ideas with an animal and figure out how it's doing, if it's hungry, and so on. You can't do this if you've attacked an animal in the last 10 minutes, so for gosh sakes, leave those chickens alone. This also lets you detect any of your favorite enemy within 5 miles of you if you spend 1 minute concentrating. You know how many there are if there are multiple groups and their direction and distance. You can also pick a conclave. We'll go to our favorite beholder and take Monster Slayer from Xanathars. You get the spell Protection from Good and Evil here for free. It's a first level spell that takes one action to cast and provides a target with advantage defending from aberrations, celestials, elementals, fey, fiends, or undead. These types of enemies have disadvantage on attack rolls against the target and cannot charm, frighten, or possess them. You can also pick another ranger spell at this level. I take Absorb Elements from Xanathars. This lets you use your reaction whenever you take Acid, Cold, Fire, Lightning, or Thunder damage to get resistance to whatever type hit you. Then deal an extra d6 of that damage type when you attack next round. It's sort of like a mirror shield. As far as Conclave abilities go, you get Hunter's Sense. This lets you use an action to choose a creature within 60 feet of you and find out if they have any damage immunities, resistances, or vulnerabilities. You can do this a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier per long rest, just like when Navi gives you hints to kill an enemy. There's also Slayer's Prey, which lets you choose an enemy as a bonus action within 60 feet to deal an extra 1d6 damage to the first time you hit it each round. So if you're keeping track here, you can put a Hunter's Mark on something the first turn then add your Slayer's Prey the next round and deal an extra 2d6 damage per round. You'll get even more potential damage at the 4th level of Ranger. Instead of an ability score improvement, take the Sharpshooter feat. It lets you add 10 damage to a roll if you're willing to subtract 5 from your chance to hit. 
You should have at least plus 6 to hit standard, so this shouldn't be a huge problem, but use True Strike if you're too nervous. Additionally, you don't have disadvantage firing at long range and ignore all but full cover. Time for the great 5th level Ranger debate. The player's Handbook Ranger gets an extra attack, the Revised Ranger gets a Conclave feature. In all Conclaves attached to that Unearthed Arcana, that feature is an extra attack, except for the Beastmaster, which gives an extra attack to your beast. Xanathar Conclaves don't have anything detailed at 5th level. The general consensus seems to be that you can give them an extra attack. If your DM isn't cool with this, that's up to them. This build is still pretty good and we'll get one later. You also get Zone of Truth as a Ranger spell. It lets you create a 15 radius sphere within 60 feet of you that forces charisma saves against your Ranger DC, which is your wisdom plus your proficiency plus 8, or that creature cannot tell a lie within the radius. Both you and the afflicted are aware that the spell is cast and whether or not they pass or fail the save. Kind of like the Lens of Truth. You can also pick a spell, take Animal Friendship, which lets you convince a beast that you are its friend. It lasts 24 hours, but ends early if someone attacks it, so leave the chickens alone. At level 6 of Ranger, your favorite enemy improves. You can pick between one of these new types, Aberrations, Celestials, Constructs, Dragons, Elementals, Fiends, or Giants, and gain all standard benefits of the original favorite enemy ability. I'd pick Dragons, but Link has probably slayed all of these at some point over the years. Your damage also increases to plus 4, and you have advantage on saving throws against any spells or abilities they use. This will also bump you up to 3rd level spells, so check out Water Breathing with your Druid abilities. This lets up to 10 creatures breathe underwater for 24 hours, like Zora's Tunic, but for 10 friends. Ranger level 7 gives you Supernatural Defenses, which lets you add 1d6 to ability checks and saving throws you get to escape from an enemy that you've marked with your Slayer's Prey. Think of it as a dodge roll. You also get another Ranger spell, Take Flame Arrows, which lets you add 1d6 fire damage to 12 pieces of ammunition. It takes an action to cast, and you must maintain concentration. It keeps the arrows lit for one hour. Ranger level 8 is an ability score improvement, but will take the Blade Mastery feat from an Unearthed Arcana. You can look it up online. It gives you plus 1 to attack rolls with your sword. You can also use your reaction to increase your AC by 1, and you have advantage on attacks of opportunity, as long as you're holding your sword. It's not as great as a Master Sword should be, but it's a start. Oh, you also get Fleet of Foot, which lets you dash as a bonus action. That's nice. Considering Link continues to grow throughout the game, it's a little hard to say where we want to end this build, but this would probably be a good point. I mean, we're not stopping, we never do, but this might be a good spot. Back to Druid for a couple levels, a third level Druid gives you a fourth level slot, so look into Wall of Fire. You can make a normal wall, but let's make this Din's Fire. Stick with a ringed wall. The wall is 20 feet high and 1 foot thick, in a circle that's 20 feet in diameter. Anything standing in a wall's space has to make a dexterity save equal to your druid spell save, which is actually the same as your ranger's, 8 plus your wisdom plus your proficiency. They take 5d8 fire damage on failed saves, and half on a successful save. Take that damage when entering the flame or if they end their turn in it. You can keep this active for up to 1 minute as long as you maintain your concentration. Level 4 Druid gives you an ability score improvement, and we're actually going to take it. Round off odd numbers in Dexterity, Wisdom, or Strength. We'll end things off by taking 4 quick Fighter levels. Level 5 Fighter gives you extra attack, so if your DM said no when you were a Ranger, you've got it now. But if they said yes, too bad, this doesn't stack with that. We're really doing this for more ability score improvements, and you get one at the 6th level. So, go for Dex, it increases your accuracy and damage with your attacks. Level 7 Cavaliers get Warding Maneuver, which lets you roll 1d8 as a reaction and add this to the AC of a friendly creature being attacked. This includes yourself and Epona. You can do this an amount of times equal to your constitution modifier per long rest. Link's Capstone is an ability score improvement from Fighter Level 8. Throw it on your dex or your wisdom, but if you rolled lucky enough to have those capped already, constitution and strength are good too. Now that we've hit level 20, let's talk about how good of a build this is. First, you can do massive amounts of damage. You can make two sharpshooter attacks per round, while still having plus 8 to hit, and add a d6 worth of damage to every hit with Hunter's Mark, and the first hit of every round with Slayer's Prey. You also get plus 4 damage if it's your favorite enemy. 
That's somewhere between 45 and 74 damage per round from the ranged attacks. Your melee attacks are also good, but you don't have sharpshooter ability for those. The biggest strength of this build though is its versatility. You have all weapons, a horse, spells, beast shapes, and a multitude of other features and languages out of combat as well. For weaknesses, you're suffering from a lack of talk good attitude. All those languages mean nothing if you take a penalty every time you open your mouth. You've also invested a lot of levels in a horse that can't climb ladders, see in the dark, or really do much of anything outside of an open field. Overall, the Hero of Time is quite the capable adventurer. He's a jack of all trades and master of several. Just remember he's used to traveling alone, so maybe have someone else handle the social challenges. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe. This week we made a character who can't wear any metal. Next week we're going to make a character who wears a lot of it.